What is up, Dragon Ballers, and welcome back to Get the Mic, the only show where the, your hosts on the left, Owl, and on the right, Brock, dissect fiction for its mythological significance. And on this episode, we are continuing our journey into the general blue saga of Dragon Ball within the larger Red Ribbon Army arc. In particular, we are getting into um, how the confrontation of Roshi and the Red Ribbon forces uh, transpires. That's a lot of what this episode is. There's a little bit of filler, but it's uh, it's pretty good. It actually develops some of our favorite characters, such as Blanche and Roshi, of course. And Launch. And Launch. <clears throat> Meanwhile, our uh, dragon team, henceforth known as the Go Crew, are down and they are in a submarine in a cave searching for the Dragon Ball. I, I can't... Do, do they know that Blue's after them yet? Not yet. It's I don't in this think episode they're aware they yet out, yeah. as he's following. Yes. And so then they find out. And that's, I think, pretty much a good basic thing, premise to go on. Yeah. Anything to add in this beginning other than please subscribe and like if, if you enjoy our content. Hit the bell for notifications. We upload Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday on YouTube, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on Rumble and BitChute. So yeah. be sure to check us out on those websites. Yeah, please please give us a rumble on the Vumble. Give us a grumble on the Pumble. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So in the recap, we kind of see this exact thing we were talking about. Our Goku is down below the depth searching for the Dragon Ball. While the Red Ribbon Army forces have mobilized and are now hunting them under the water and have sent their air squadron to go take out Roshi on Kame, at Kame House to get the Dragon Balls from there and to capture the scientist who created the Dragon Radar. Red assumes that Roshi, being old, is a scientist and wants Blue to capture him so that he can recreate the Dragon Radar, the more sophisticated form of the radar than the Red Ribbon forces have. I do like There's a lot going on here. I like that idea because it it speaks to what the Red Ribbon Army wants, that they approach Master Roshi as if he were a scientist and, and that they think what they're going to get from him is something scientific and that they think they're going to get the dragon radar from Roshi. I well, don't think that they're taking him very seriously it's, in that it's, sense. It's almost like the how in the Lord of the Rings, Sauron thought that Aragorn was going to use the ring against him. He figured that the hero, the king, would be the, the person wielding the power to, to slay the adversary, right? Right, and that he so, would be using something that manipulates the material world. And so since Sauron's gaze is so narrow, that's kind of what's happening here. It, the Red's gaze is so narrow that he can only see an old man as a scientist and not as what Roshi actually instantiates, which is the spiritual ancestors. So that's to say that the wisdom that you get from the... Or the the, from the spiritual paternal. father yeah, spiritual is father. something that is material and technological when you don't actually understand that that wisdom is something that transcends that and it's more, um, I would say, a higher order of thinking. Right. If you're looking at it only as a tool to use, it's only going to appear as what Red is seeing it as. And I think that's a great place to leave off as we go into the episode because we're going to... Gonna... lead off or leave off? To lead into, I oh, should say. Okay. I think that's a great place to lead into what's really going on with this episode, right? Definitely, yeah. And um, it is a episode of um, misconceptions, and I would say sight misplaced. Is there a word for that? Sight misplaced. I wonder. General blindness. And so. Let's go ahead and continue. I think what uh, we do see one other thing though. This episode is titled. Roshi surprise. Roshi surprise. Roshi supreme. Yeah, and see, yeah, they they don't know uh, Blue is down there. Um, Goku, Bulma, Krillin, who have come to an underground cave. Oh, no, no. They do. 
They do know that they're there, but they're chasing them down the cave already. So the Go crew has no chance but to go forward. Um, the Red Ribbon Army has closed off their retreat in the back of the cave, and they've used torpedoes. And so they're racing as fast as they can uh, to get to the entrance to the cave where they can breathe and get out of the submarine. Yeah, they they are committed to their uh, path at this point, right? Because to turn away from the path that they're on would be to confront the army, I guess you could say, to turn against a, an adversarial force. So they have to continue to find, well, they're essentially... I'm trying to think of the word that I want. They have um, a motivation. Not necessarily a motivation, but they have a responsibility now to keep pursuing what they see as the truth down here in the depths of, of what the ocean represents. To turn back from the wisdom that they're pursuing now in pursuit of that wisdom or that dragon ball would be to face almost a, an adversary automatically, right? Almost as if nature itself does not want you to turn back from pursuing truth. Well, <clears throat> I think I see what you're where you're going, and it, I think it's to a point to where once the heroes have journeyed a certain point, the only thing that can save them is the wisdom gained from the unknown. And if they cannot attain that wisdom, they'll be swallowed up by all the unknown that they've taken on. And that's something that happens in Pinocchio. He actually dies from the experience of the unknown. I guess it's kind of like that the night is darkest before the dawn idea, right? That it gets more and more difficult to sort of bear the the difficulty of the journey towards the light the further you get towards it. And so there's a certain point where it you have to continue on your path well, there's towards a certain enlightenment. Point, right, there's a certain point where that enlightenment is closer and can save you from the things around you than turning back. Right. And I think like another example from Lord of the Rings is Sam doesn't return to the Shire. I mean, he's way... He, he realizes what happens and he goes and helps Frodo out of Shelob's lair, let's say. I think that's a really good example, especially just whenever you think of the path and the and the way that the hobbits are sort of I almost think of them laying their feet in a direction. They're they're turned in a direction, right? Mm -hmm. And and they, they even speak in the book in that sort of sense that it's like now that my feet are on this path and they're oriented in a direction in that physical sense. Yeah, I mean, even one of the poems that Bilbo sings, the road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, it is an. Uh, it's a great understanding of the mythos of the journey. I think that that's that's a really good um, reference to make here because this is sort of the continuation of the path, and that's why the Dragon Ball is here, right? Because that this is part of being on that path as it becomes more and more articulated. And, and I really, you know, to mention something that we were talking about earlier, the context of later episodes, it really, this is the beginning of how deep we're going to feel the characters have gotten, like, underground, far from the sun, right? Because it's several episodes before they'll see it again. Right, we're departing from the wisdom that you'll gain from the Solar Father, in that sense. And now we're going somewhere deep and primordial, going down into the depths. And we'll see exactly what that wisdom is very soon. Right. So let's go ahead and continue. So back at Kame House, Roshi is trying to use the microband to disintegrate his spirit small enough to where he can look at launch as she uses the bathroom, takes a shower, whatever perverted thing that Roshi has in mind. But his his antics fail. He is unable to do so. He actually spills some pepper on her in the kitchen, and that causes her to sneeze, revealing Blanche. Blonde Launch. Blonde Launch um, is tricked and convinced that Roshi is simply her roommate and that uh, 
they're very they're very close and that Roshi should give her a massage, right? It's uh well, I don't even necessarily consider it to be a trick. I think that there's something symbolically happening as Roshi is more and more able to integrate uh, his spirit with what Launch is, right? And so there's times when we see that Blonde Launch is manifested and immediately becomes adversarial towards Roshi and attacks him, and and there's no reconciliation. But we're already seeing a sort of setup that Blonde Launch and Roshi actually can coexist, and Roshi is able to... um to calm her down and sort of uh, bring peace to that situation. Like they can coexist, right? <laughs> and he does appease her, right? Uh, it, it is to say that the spiritual father here subordinates himself to the idea of what launch could be, right? Which is a, let's say, functional person instead of a psychopathic or... Um... It's about respect, right? Right. He puts her in a proper place of respect. And, and this is symbolic of what we're going to be seeing in this, this arc, right? He's putting her into the right um, place as far as he interprets her. He's putting her in reverence, right? And so in a sort of microcosm of what's going to happen as our Go crew heads down into the depths of the feminine unconscious, here we see Roshi is actually able to interface with the adversarial feminine spirit and actually find peace with it and put it in its proper place and put it and respect somewhat, it as much as it needs to be. Place, right? Because, I mean, ultimately it does need something else. But before we continue... Right, that's an, that's an overarching right. theme. Before, but... before we get to the next set, because I think we'll continue this discussion in the next set of clips, I do want to talk about Roshi's uh, perversions here. Right. Uh, so, in particular, the repeated attempts in the... Um, it, it's, it seems almost in his nature, right, this flaw of his, and it's not something that should, and I think by design, should not be overcome. It's part of his blindness. And so when in Super... He's like, oh, well, I don't care about women anymore, right? It's like, oh, well, you just stripped away another layer of Master Roshi, didn't you? Yeah, I think that there's a humanity to Roshi because we have to keep him grounded in this physical experience, right? To take that away from him and just say that, oh, well, he's now just the master, but he still keeps the sunglasses is to kind of miss the point of, um, I guess, how the spirit of Roshi is in the earthly experience we have, right? That it's manifest around us, no matter how corrupted it could be. It's there to find and to respect still, right? Yeah, and I think, too, it's it's worth mentioning that um, the only character so far to get along with Blonde Launch at all is Roshi. She doesn't even like Goku. Nope. Goku has to kick her in the face. No, I, I and I mean that that adversarial feminine spirit doesn't it, really like how Goku is. Is right? she adversarial or is she rogue? I I think she's more no, not roguish. I think she's more of an anti hero, right? She's she's more of that out for herself, moral, morally. Uh, she she's not trying to be a tyrant, let's say. Not tyrannically, no. I, I would just say adversarially just because of because what what brings her to be manifest in the world, right? And sure, it's but, a... but Blonde Launch isn't against being. She's not no, adversarial no, 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 no. against being. No, I wouldn't say that she's adversarial. I guess not in that mythical adversarial sense. I guess that's a bad term to use considering what we're talking about. Um, but I would say that she is... Uh, If I were to align her with a sort of um, mythical spirit, it would be aligned m more along the lines of like the terrible mother, right? The, the necessary um, aggressive aspects of mother nature. Well, I to think... To protect the... Protect being. I think, too, it's to say that the... the 
interaction of the masculine and feminine is, is dangerous. It is a creative and destructive power, right? And so Blonde Launch here represents that destructive power of merging with what's truly feminine, right? And that, maybe not merging is the right word, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that dis that destructive power of um the realization of both the masculine and the feminine, and I, particularly because Goku and Krillin are around Blonde Launch as she goes through this process of docilization, if you will. Uh, she kind of gives a glimpse of that that danger, right? Uh made manifest in physical form. I think that that is part of it. The I Part of why I call her an adversarial entity, you can think of her response to Goku whenever she wakes up and Goku is in her bed, right? And consider it to be more of a symbolic thing where she... Her, whenever she sneezes, whenever Blue Launch sneezes, I should say, it usually happens part, as part of a pattern where it would be necessary for Blonde Launch to come into the scene and protect Blue Launch from something that could possibly be stepping too far into a direction that isn't respecting the, femi the feminine spirit, right? And I think that there's sort of an interplay there where the show is very aware of w the right amount of reverence towards the feminine spirit that you should have. And it's playing around with that idea in Roshi where he's pushing and pushing against that. And having that dichotomy with blue and blonde launch really helps to delineate that where the, uh, the spirit of the father should be regarding the feminine spirit and how it shouldn't be overstepping its boundaries. And it, and it, ha it should have that reverence for the power of femininity in society. Yes, and let's also say the dangers of taking advantage of the feminine as as a masculine spirit, right? As right, that it'll snap back, that it'll protect itself from that, and that it needs to be revered and put into its proper place so that there can be peace. I just wanted to point that out in, in those specific terms because that's what Roshi is able to start doing not that he can put it properly because we're going to see it work towards that but right now this is i think the first time we really see him being able to even approach that right right and uh I, yeah i think it's uh, pretty significant that that happens and so then the next thing that happens is that the red ribbon army has begun to arrive on the roshi's island uh as Roshi is trying to appease Blonde Launch with uh, food, which she says is terrible, and so she pulls out her gun ready to shoot him, mm -hmm. but Turtle uses a little leaf and makes her sneeze. And I think it's significant that Turtle does so because of what Turtle is, his disembodiment, right, of that consciousness. Uh, let's say Roshi's consciousness. Right, as we've seen with Bulma and Oolong and then Yamcha and Poir, we see this dichotomy again. Except, you know, with I mean, Turtle is a far ascended hierarchical figure than Oolong. Exactly. Roshi is... And that's why he's able much, to do he, that. Roshi is a cosmic figure in comparison to what uh, Bulma and Yamcha and are. And so it's right? instantiated earthly. with his name, right? He is the turtle hermit, and his... And the voice he has in his head is more like the voice of God. <laughs> the voice of God. Yes, exactly. <clears throat> and it's it's yeah. not... Uh, because, like, Puar will lie to Yamcha and say he's right. the greatest. But Turtle will tell Roshi the truth because he is more of an aligned spirit in that way. Right, I think that both in Yamcha and Bulma, that consciousness feeds into their ego. And so, you know, Oolong simps for Bulma, Poir simps for Yamcha, 
but we have criticism coming from Turtle towards Roshi, and I think that that's because that consciousness is actually placed in the in the right position in the hierarchy. It should be a judge, and it should be judging you. Right. What Roshi has disembodied from himself is not his masculine or feminine psyche, but actually the judge itself to judge him uh, as he takes action in the world. And that judge then knows the proper place for, let's say, femininity in the world. And, and it also, as not only a judge, but a purveyor of wisdom, is able to identify the dangers that Blonde Launch presents by being exposed too quickly. And what I mean is... um exposing the order to chaos too quickly will cause the whole system to collapse. And so Blonde Launch, being a more chaotic spirit of femininity than Blue Launch, exposing too much is is bad for the order, and so Turtle takes steps to, to mitigate that. Yeah, I think that that's, it's a setup for a payoff we get in this episode, too that the interplay both ways goes through Turtle, and that and that, that interplay being able to be uh, called forth, I guess I would say, is something that that voice would have the power to do right, that it would be able to discern that and to almost control it, right? What do you mean control it? That it can call it forth. And, and tell it whenever it should be manifest to, to oppose a spirit or to to bring it forth in the consciousness of the of the of the culture or of the spiritual father or of the you know of the master whatever it is to it that it can call it forth because it knows that it is needed. Mm -hmm. Whereas sort of the more egotistical or rational mind wouldn't respect it so much. Right. And I, and that's exactly how turtle also has more autonomy than the other two, because he's able to act on those, um, necessary actions. And so we do see though, uh, captain dark is his name. Captain Dark has arrived on Roshi's Island and surrounded the good hermit with many men and guns. I think that's the last part here. Uh, nothing too significant to say in this first part. We haven't seen them interact at all yet, but we will in just a second. No, I just, I, I, I really wanted to make sure that we covered the turtle. Well, well, something that Launch. could be very easily overlooked about this episode whenever you're analyzing the series, right? It's like, oh, okay, we just see Roshi and Launch around the house, sitting around, and then he I makes her mad. I think this is actually a filler part, to be honest. But it is very representative of a pattern that we see throughout the I rest should, of the series. I should stop right? using filler and say anime only. Sure. I, I don't think that it's filler. I don't think... I think that it's in the spirit. I think that as they were... And I know that sounds crazy. As they were padding out the runtime, they were actually honoring the spirit of the story, which is, I know, it's it's unheard of. Now. Well, it's the equivalent of expecting people belie to believe that this group of monkeys actually did write Shakespeare. <laughs> Here right. it is. Like we all could agree on a spirit of something that's good enough to be Shakespeare, right? Well, that's the other problem. But anyway, so uh, we do see that the army has arrived and Roshi intends to deal with it. And so Captain Dark jumps down. He looks like Fat Hitler. He has a whip and the Red Ribbon soldiers are sent inside the house. He tells Roshi that he knows he's Dr. Brief and that he invented the Dragon Radar. He's a professor. Roshi pretty much laughs at him and says that he's not. He 
he doesn't. He, I think he says he knows who they are, though. He's like, I've heard of you guys. You have a horrible reputation. All this. Yeah, thing. he says that, and he turns back to launch, and he's like, it looks like these guys are kind of mistaken. Like it's it's so casual to Roshi that it's it's almost comical, right? That as we've seen these interactions with the Red Ribbon Army, and they've been so malicious and threatening, they show up to Roshi's island, and he's like, Oh, you think you're on my level? Right, and the Red Ribbon Army, and particularly Captain Dark, does think that he is on the level of Roshi, and it goes to show that vision that we've been talking about this this episode, um, the vision on Roshi here as a professor blinds them to his actual strength, uh, and Captain Dark, who clearly his mode of being, his uh, I think illustrated by his whip, right, his sadistic mode of being is not going to be enough to challenge the spiritual father. And so Roshi intends to fight. Right. And and wielding a whip, I mean, just across symbols going back to, you know, biblical text, it, he thinks of himself as a master, right? He thinks of himself as categorically above the enemies that he comes across, right? And so he thinks that just by his presence, he's going to put Roshi into a sort of submission, right? Yeah, exactly, and uh, I think that's what he is used to happening, um, particularly because he is rather indulgent, and he seems to indulge in his vices, as illustrated by both his physical appearance and his his weapon of choice. Well, I do want to say that we as mystical human beings always consider something to be above the logical or the scientific. And that something always has to have a role that's filled. And if you're acting in a way that you could say is godless, a lot of times you put yourself at the top of that hierarchy. You say, I am above um, the way that things are. And so, in, in a sense, you elevate yourself to godhood when you're this egotistical whenever you think that you have that purity within you. And I think that that's what we're seeing with this fascistic manifestation in the Red Ribbon Army. So he's like, this fat Hitler thinks that he's he's pure in a sense that's godly, meaning that that, that cleanliness is godliness, right? And we see that manifest in, in blue as well. But he thinks that he's above the best scientist, right? to say that he's categorically above science, that well, he is like a god in and of his own little cosmology. I was going to say because he has the powers of coercion, right? Um, he's not a god in the sense that he is going to be better at science than a scientist, but he can force the scientist to do whatever he wants, so all that knowledge is useless to the scientist. And I think... And that's to elevate that's power f- to be the ultimate principle, right? Right, and I think that's a fact he rather revels in, and that's why he's so confident when he first comes down on Roshi. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's what Roshi laughs at, though. He says, oh, if that's your terms, then I guess come at me, because that means that you're spiritually inferior to me. And so he beckons them. He says, I guess I'll oppose you then. <laughs> And so we see exactly what that means for Roshi as he opens a a can of whoop ass on them. And did I skip one? No. No, it's no, just no, all one. It's just all shuffled. Yeah. Uh so yeah, Roshi opens up a can of whoop ass. They hold Blue Launch hostage. Turtle makes her sneeze and Blonde Launch wrecks the red ribbon guys as Roshi uh fights them, grabs some bullets and Orders the last guy to clean up. Yeah, it's it's kind of a display because Roshi beats down a few guys and then they try to shoot him and he catches the bullets in his hands and then he drops them to the ground and uh, the guys raise, raise their guns on him again. And, and he it, just stomps them. He's like, okay, well, I guess that's what you get. And it's funny, too, that he does that. He, he does it as a show of power, and there's finally, I think, one or two guys left, and he turns to this guy, and he says, all right, well, clean these guys up. Get them off my island. And now he's the top of the hierarchy. He's proven himself to actually be the thing that is above the scientist. Not only that, but it 
is worth mentioning too that he has done that in front of Blonde Launch and he actually drags Blonde Launch away to get her to stop killing these he's gonna kill that guy to stomp right. him to death right and so it's kind of significant that they've come that far because that's a that's a more um comradely interaction than they've ever had before yeah that's relationship goals because Re- relationship goals yes because what we have here so you know Turtle is then able to make her sneeze oh, again. Oh, also about that. Yeah, Turtle, um, being who Turtle is, right, is able to be called forth, like Brock said, uh, when 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 it is needed, if one is pursuing things truthfully and forthrightly. And Roshi, by telling them right away, I'm not a professor, he didn't try to lie, um, he, he wasn't trying to be duplicitous in any way, he basically said, get off my island. Um, it, it does allow for Turtle to turn launch back. Yeah, that's to say that he's acting truthfully through and through here. He's not bullying. He's not acting emo. You could say he's not acting emotionally just because they made him mad. And so the fact that he is still in tune with launch shows that this is actually a reasonable response. That this isn't him being like, oh, I'm insulted by you being on my island. This is like, I'm in the right here. Mm -hmm. My response is actually emotionally valid. And it is. Uh, I, I, oh, okay, Turtle does that. That's right. I think there's only one guy left, and he tells him to clean up. And so let's go ahead and move on. So now we get back to our Go crew after Roshi takes out the trash. Fat Hitler and his gang. We're back underground. They're walking in the cave, and General Blue is close behind our precious dragon crew. They've both gotten out of their submarines. Yeah, this is after Blue has rammed into them. Oh, Blue rams them. That's right. Yeah, so there's a sub chase. Yeah, he just chases them around and rams into them, and they surface and find this cave underneath the water. I I do like this. It's almost as if the chaos is becoming more and more specific as they get towards the wisdom here in the unconscious. So it's like water to cave, and then we see it become more and more and more articulated. And more room, and then yeah. definitely, yeah. But here, right when it manifests, they find the cave in the water, right? They find the habitable space for them to inter- interface here deep in the in the water. And so they have no choice but to continue on and to follow this cave to see where it goes. And, yeah, and I think the other thing to mention is that Blue's complete lack of both hesitation and lack of um, arrogance because he warns his men to be careful of these kids even though they're kids to treat them like adults and shoot them if they can and kill them as soon as as soon as possible yeah he specifically mentions that it's commendable that they've gotten where they've gotten and that they should be treated with caution and so we see now that he is a, a bit different from everyone that has preceded him coming from the red ribbon army because everybody before has underestimated and treated Goku as a child and the crew as children. And they've laughed at even after like White's whole crew had been destroyed, he was he was laughing at Goku and still thought he could tear him up. Which actually he, he did win, but Aider saw it at the end of that. Right. White well, is an interesting issue. It was a Pyrrhic victory for White. Yeah, definitely a Pyrrhic victory. But uh, this, and I, I do also want to say that the arrival up out of that unconscious to the conscious formulated space within this, it's that entering of that white dot. So now they're in the white dot, right? And we're about to see the white dot become a white dot. Right. We are now approaching the logic behind the chaos in the black half of the yin and yang, right? We're mm-hmm. finding the logos here, and or you could say this is like stepping onto the moon in the night, right? This is the thing that is enlightening 
within that darkness. Yeah, or discovering the, the wisdom, the treasure mm -hmm. in the dark. In the dark. And so we see finally a couple of things. Goku turns on the lights. That's already an in intonation of what we've been saying, right? It's that illumination below the water, underground, in the darkness. It's that light in the darkness, right? And so he does that, and they find a pirate's skeleton. And so Bluma tells him a little bit about the pirate treasure, or is it Krillin? I can't remember. One of them says something about the pirate I think treasure. it's Bulma. I think it, Bulma remembers the tale of the treasure, but not after Goku scares her by wearing the skull oh, of yes. the pirate on his head. Yes. And I think that that's actually pretty significant for what these next few episodes are going to be about, right? That... Well, okay, go ahead. That this spirit to can be ter suddenly terrifying to Bulma. Because... We always keep coming back to this idea of Bulma and Yamcha interplaying this protagonist role in a more symbolic sense. And so as soon as they get here, what happens for Bulma? The, the spirit that Goku represents terrifies her and takes on the visage of death. Mm -hmm. And Goku laughs about it, and it's sort of a joke to him. But this is foreshadowing what we're about to deal with in theme and literally what's about to happen in the story, right? Yes. And I also want to mention as well uh, the whole pirate aspect of it. So pirates being, right, those outside, and this comes in with the, let's say, the light in the dark part of the Paisley. Uh, pirates themselves are not good moral actors. They accumulate this wealth like dragons accumulate wealth and valuables. And it, it could be ideas. It doesn't have to specifically be gold, let's say. But this uh, logos-oriented treasure that can be gained is part of that draconic spirit, which we're going to see a dragon in the next episode, next couple episodes. Yeah. Well, I also... I think back to the phrase, there's no church in the wild, right? You think about that when Nature it comes to... Nature is red and tooth and claw. Exactly, and that comes to pirates. That's how pirates are. They live by the sword and they die by the sword. They are almost as if they're living as nature intended. Yeah, and they're very chaotic by nature. And I think that kind of brings us naturally to an end for this episode. Right. One thing I want to point out is they comment aloud that this must mean that the pirate treasure is here because they know of the legend or the myth yes. of the treasure that would be found in a place like this. And Blue hears it and he comments to himself that this, oh, this discovery, yeah, yeah. I think he says it rivals the Dragon Ball. And we see a bit of blindness here on, on Blue's part. Well, and I think it's because Blue estimates the ability for the Red Ribbon Army to take over the world is already substantial. And so the Dragon Balls being a more super superfluous thing than a vast hoard of treasure. I I'm not sure, though. Um, that's an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Well, I would say that it's a manifestation of the way that Blue sees things, where he values the image of the thing rather than the spirit. And hmm. so that's how he treats himself, right? And we see how he takes himself as his ego or his persona so seriously. Well, I'm, in, I'm but interested his spirit to hear is not tended to. Why, why it would be. I, I suppose the treasure would be more. Well, it's his vanity, right? Because yeah. I, I, I want to put it this way as we start. He's also never seen a Dragon Ball. Well, I want to I put it this way before we get because I into do... this story, because this is. I think this is necessarily an aspect of it that we have to take into account, and it's that we're looking into the water right now, right? We're gazing down into the depths. Blue now is revealing himself as a narcissist-type figure. What does Blue see when he looks down into the depths but himself? And so that egotistical, narcissistic element of Blue 
is becoming more and more manifest as we deal with him here in this story, right? And we're actually coming into contact with that aspect of him. So that said, I don't think that he would value the Dragon Ball or the wisdom to be found here. Instead, he only sees it for the apparent, um, you could say, monetary or capital or physical value, right? Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that is a good point. Though I also want to mention that he's never seen a Dragon Ball. Right. Well, he doesn't have a conception of it, it yes. seems, right? And so, yeah, I mean, when he thinks of the treasure, right, he knows what treasure looks like. He may not know what wisdom looks like. Well, when he sees the treasure also, he sees himself in, in, in as far as he's, he thinks of is the there world. A cli- is there a clip of that? No, I'm just not saying. Yet. Well, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, oh, okay. but we know how narcissistic oh, Blue yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. is, right? And how seriously he takes his image. Yes. And so that being the thing that he's taking away from this, I think that he he just doesn't understand the the dichotomy there, where there's a physical gain, right? There's something to be seen when gazing into the water That's that's a physical thing that you can take away. But there is a spiritual treasure down here that he discounts, and that's why he says that this rivals the Dragon Ball. He says, like, this is the thing that Red's going to want. And, of course, we see later on Red knows better than he does. But I think that's why Blue isn't able to see that. Mm. Blinded by that ego narcissism Mm -hmm. that allows one only to see the surface-level value of things. Hmm, interesting. I've seen it before. Anyways, I think this is a good place to wrap up, right? Yeah. All right, so if you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe. Ring the bell for notifications. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a subscrungle on Rumble and give us a bit shoot on bit shoot. Mm. Click the longle bungle. We upload episodes Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday on YouTube and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on our alternative Tech sites, alt tech, would you say? Yeah, I guess that's the colloquial term for it, right? Yeah. And uh, I hope I hope to see any of you guys there. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I'm your host on the left, Al. I'm your host on the right, Brock. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>